Major underwriting for A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles was provided by the Baton Rouge Convention and Visitors Bureau. In Baton Rouge, our past is your present. Baton Rouge, authentic Louisiana at every turn. And People's Drug Stores, serving South Louisiana for generations. George and Shirley Piku are proud supporters of A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles. And by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Where you have this architecture, history, music, and the bittersweet cry of the blues. Especially the blues. There you go. How about a dozen? Red beans and rice. We rolling, y'all. We're a nation of immigrants, a country with roots in other soils. Nowhere is that more true than in the country of Louisiana. I'm Chef John Falls, inviting you to tune in to A Taste of Louisiana and a new series dedicated to our food heritage. Louisianians are descendants of seven primary nations that have influenced every dish we cook today. Welcome to A Taste of Louisiana. Doing, huh? Good yeah. couple eyes, so you doing all right? How you doing, Doc? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Y'all doing good there. Hey, how you doing, Paul? Nice to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, how y'all doing? Yeah. Fire Brown. Good to see you, man. Y'all doing all right? Hey, Paul. <laughs> y'all, thanks so much. Wow, what a great crowd in here today. Thanks a million, y'all, for being in my kitchen as we continue to search out all of those fabulous food cultures and the great cuisine that made Louisiana the fabulous food and state of great culture we are. And I tell you, you being in the seat today, you're gonna, you're gonna experience everything I know about Spain, <laughs> about Spain's influence. Huh? Jambalaya, do I remember that? I remember it. I'm gonna feed it to you, y'all, so relax. Just stay right there. Don't, don't, don't get up. There's a lot happening here. Y'all, because the English are remembered for settling the Northeast and France for colonizing Louisiana, it might be forgotten that Spain was actually the first to explore the New World. Spain set up Louisiana's system of laws. Spain influenced the architecture of the French Quarter. Spain established the French markets of New Orleans. Dr. Paul Hoffman joins me in introducing to you Spanish Louisiana. Spain's period of glory began with the reign of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand in the latter part of the 15th century. Known as the Catholic Kings, they sponsored Christopher Columbus's voyage that ultimately led to the discovery of the New World. The Spanish conquistadors explored and mapped Louisiana as early as the 1500s. Hernando de Soto is recognized as the first to discover the Mississippi River. He died during the exploration and according to legend, was buried in a log to keep his body from floating. After all, the Native Americans assumed he was a god. Though Spain explored Louisiana first, France claimed the territory and began colonization. In 1762, France gave Louisiana to Spain with the secret Treaty of Fontainebleau. The first Spanish governor, Don Antonio de Ulia, arrived in March 1766. He was selected because he spoke French. He had been trained partially and educated partially in France. Uh, he was well known as, a, as an investigator. Uh, and so he was brought in with a charge to essentially find out what needed to be done with Louisiana. His less than warm reception escalated into open rebellion in 1768. As he fled for his life, his replacement, Governor Don Alejandro O'Reilly, an Irish soldier of fortune, arrived to quell the rebellion. O'Reilly arrested and shot the more vocal opponents of the revolt, earning him the name Bloody O'Reilly. The next Spanish governor, Amazaga, was quickly followed by Don Bernardo de Galvez, for whom Galveston, Texas, and our own St. Bernard Parish are named. Bernardo de Galvez was the nephew of the Minister of the Indies, so he was about as well connected as anyone in the New World could be. Uh, he spoke French and knew how to ingratiate himself with people. 
Following Galvez was Spanish Governor Miro. The second wave of Acadians arrived here during his tenure. In 1788, the Great Fire destroyed more than 800 buildings in New Orleans. New building codes followed, creating the dominant Spanish architecture seen in the French Quarter today. The patios, the inner courtyards, along with the shady arcades and cooling fountains are all of Spanish design. The Cabildo, St. Louis Cathedral, and the Presbytere exemplify typical Spanish style. Uh, under Spanish law, women had property rights, married women had property rights. Uh, it was possible for slaves to buy their freedom, and many had done so. Uh, New Orleans itself had developed into a, a reasonably respectable city uh, with a large number of different kinds of professions in it, professional people in it. Despite Spain's incredible leadership, French Louisiana refused to change culturally. The colonists still spoke French. The newspapers were French. The language of commerce remained French. Spanish men who married French women learned to speak French and raised French Creole, not Spanish Creole children. Though Spanish ways and customs were never fully adopted by the French, they certainly owed a greater debt of gratitude to Spain for their survival and success than France, their mother country. Well, I, I, I told you we were going to introduce the nation to a lot they may not know about the Spanish culture here in Louisiana, one of the great foundations for our history. And you know what? When you look at the logo on my jacket here, I was talking to uh, Dr. Paul Hoffman uh, from LSU, who was in that piece just now. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. You were wonderful uh, in there. I was telling him that on my company logo, there's the Castile of Spain that reminds me and everybody in my company that even though the Acadians arrived here in 1750 to 1765, thinking they were coming to a French port and that France would welcome in the French Acadians, the Spanish were here and in charge. And it was the Spanish government, the Cabildo, who said, come on in, we need you. Not because they loved the French, but because they needed people in those forts to protect the city of New Orleans against the, uh, against the British. But we didn't care. We took over anyway, you know, so the kids. <laughs> but anyway, y'all, Dr. Paul Hoffman, th thank you so much for thank being you. here with us today. And y'all, you've been listening to this great music over here as well. And I want to thank uh, Neil and Donna Wilkinson uh, for being here with us, supplying our music in the kitchen today. Thank y'all so much. Very nice. And, uh, and also, in a little while, we're going to talk about jambalaya, and we're going to talk about pay, and we're going to talk about those great Spanish rice dishes. And T. Wayne Abshire is the champ of champs of the jambalaya cooking here in Louisiana. So I'm going to steal all the tips I can steal from, uh, from you today. So thank you all, all uh, for being here with us. Y'all, what are we going to cook? You know, so many of our great dishes uh, from Louisiana that we think of as Cajun or just blanket into Creole, can actually be traced back to some of these, the seven Creole nations, the French, the Spanish, the Germans, the Italians, the Spanish, of course. And one of the dishes that we love so much, uh, do you ever cook griots and grits? No, huh? griots and grits? Uh, the griots, the smothering of meat uh, down in a nice rich gravy with olive oil and olives and uh, all of those great flavors, Spanish, y'all. And look on the, uh, the board right here on my cutting board. And Keith, I want you to get right close to that because I'm using a round steak, but I kept that marrow bone. <sighs> oh. Oh, this was ice cream to us when I was six in Cajun country. Uh, and, and you want to make sure that uh, you're using uh, what we would call a tougher cut of meat because uh, this is one of those things that's going to take a long time to cook. And in some of the early journals of New Orleans, some of the early governments wrote that meat is so plentiful here in the colony. In fact, people in Europe would just die if they knew how much meat even the children eat here in New Orleans. Nothing's changed. I mean, we still eat a lot of meat here, and this is in the 1700s I'm talking about. So y'all, a little bit of salt on my round steak, a little bit cayenne pepper on top of it as well. I can put another little shot of pepper there. A little granulated garlic, and you just want to kind of pat it into the meat a little bit, kind of massage it uh, down in there. I'm going to put some flour because you always want to have a little bit flour. Now, flour was one of those things we were talking earlier uh, today. Uh, 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 Paul, we were saying that in early New Orleans, the Spanish regulated everything. 
And flour was one of the things, not only did they lay down the rules and regulations when they got here, they had to clean up the city from the French. Mm -hmm. So they came in and started to set up our first rules and regulations, and flour had a big thing to do with it in the mm -hmm. bakeries, right? Absolutely. Tell, tell us a little bit about how, how treacherous they were with the bakers. Well, they basically said to the bakers, you either have full weight or we close you down and they uh, monitored the quality of the flour. New Orleans is very particular. It wanted wheat flour. It wouldn't take rice flour or corn cornbread. I mean, goodness, that was uncivilized. <laughs> corn, that's animal food. Huh? That's right, it's uncivilized. <laughs> and that was always one of the great problems was getting enough flour into New Orleans to meet the demand. Right, but, but I thought it was really funny y'all to read that the, that the Spanish actually went in and took all of the bread out of the bake shops, threw it in the Mississippi River, dumped all of that flour out because they shorted the weight on the bread. To the, uh, we need a little bit of that today, you know? What I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, y'all, I have my griots going here. Now griots in the French uh, language to griller, to stick to the bottom of a cast iron pot. And this came out of the early markets in New Orleans where little pieces of meat from the butcher shops would be thrown into the cast iron pots and slowly cooked with whatever they could borrow from the other cultures, like olive oil, like fresh olives and all of that, to create a nice dish that was eaten kind of as a brunch meal about 10 o'clock in the morning. The markets opened at three or four, so by 10 they were ready for brunch or somewhere between breakfast and lunch, and griots was a meat of choice. So here, we're gonna kind of turn this over a little bit and brown uh, brown one side, then we'll brown the other side real, real nicely here. And of course, nice and spicy. Remember, Spain brought most of our hot peppers from the south, from South America. They brought the habaneros, they brought the cayennes, they brought the tabascos, they brought all of those peppers to Louisiana. And of course, for that reason, <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay, y'all, now into my pot a little bit of my onions, my trinity, my onions, my celery, bell pepper, that's, look, everybody cooks differently. So this is the way I was taught to cook, onion, celery, bell pepper, and garlic in everything we cook. I don't know about y'all, but if I don't put a lot of garlic in it, it's, uh, there you go, right there. Now, move all of that around, and then of course I'm gonna put some tomato in here, I'm gonna put some uh, fresh uh, chopped tomatoes, and you can have a little jalapeno in it if you want to. Olives go into it as well, and then some stock. Now y'all, this is gonna sit here and cook. How long? I'm gonna put a lid on this, and I'm gonna cook it till 10 o'clock when it's time to eat. <laughs> That's what the butchers would have done, three, four o'clock in the morning. And I have some already done right here. This, look how nice this is. Keith, I want you to get right in there and take a look at those griots are just falling apart, y'all, right here. And uh, this is one of the great contributions of uh, the Spanish. Now, you heard uh, Dr. Dr. Hoffman said, no grits, no corn. Uh, well, look, you know, they adapted well. So they came in and they put grits, they put the griots on top of it, they smothered it in the gravy, and all of a sudden it became one of our premier dishes of Louisiana. Even today, people will pay 30, 40 bucks for this, um, sometimes 50 in my place. Anyway, <laughs> well, hey, it's better there, y'all. <laughs> one of Louisiana's most sought after dishes is jambalaya. Songs are written about it, tourists travel thousands of miles to taste it, and great cooks compete to be named jambalaya champion every year. But let's talk about the history of this dish. As you might imagine, it's a gift from Spain. Meet two of the jambalaya champ of champs, T. Wayne Abshire and Ricky Bro. They taught me how to do it. Y'all, I'm one of the luckiest cooks in Louisiana today because I'm sitting in the garden or standing in the garden with two of Louisiana's best jambalaya cooks. T. Wayne Abshire and Ricky Bro together have won the jambalaya championship in Louisiana collectively, I guess, what, about nine or 10 times, right? Different yeah. championships. And you are the champion cook of cooks, meaning that against the jambalaya champions, you've won against them, right? Hey, wouldn't you like to be here with us? <laughs> well, you know, I think jambalaya is probably one of the most misunderstood dishes in Louisiana. Some people think it's some kind of gravy on rice, tomatoes. How would you describe jambalaya? I, I think jambalaya is uh, Louisiana's signature rice dish. Uh, there's, and like you said, there's a lot of variations to it. Uh, some good, some bad. <laughs> 
Now, uh, Ricky, going up and down the river road of Louisiana from New Orleans to Shreveport, I, I guess I should say, every mile has a different version of the dish, oh, right? Yes, uh, you see it cooked all kind of different ways. Uh, <laughs> You get out of a three parish area and it's totally different. And, and I guess it's that way with just about everything. Every little culture has their own way of doing it. Now, Gonzales, Louisiana, about, I guess, 50 miles or so west of the city of New Orleans, Gonzales is the jambalaya capital of the world and that's where you cook. So tell me a little bit about the dish that y'all actually cook at the festival. Well, it starts with whole hen, cut up hen. Chicken, yeah. Yeah and it's gotta be cooked on a wood fire. So it's cooked in a black iron pot directly on wood? Huh? Yeah, 15 gallon pot right. on wood. Um, it's usually, they give you the bell peppers and the onions and... So everybody has the same ingredients, a wood fire, and you have a certain amount of time to cook it, and then what are they tasting for? Are they tasting... Predominant chicken flavor. Ah, okay, chicken flavor. Well, I guess people wanna know where does the dish originate? Jambalaya, of course, we think from the French word jambon and then a la, ham, uh, jambon is ham, a la is with, and then yaya, an African word for rice, so ham with rice, jambon a la yaya. But let me tell you where it comes from. Here we have the Spanish dish paella. This is from Valencia, and like jambalaya, everybody has a different version. What makes this different from jambalaya, you have chicken and sausage, uh, a little pork in here and rice. But in, in a, a paella, we use an arborio rice and you use just a short grain rice. Long grain. A long grain rice, so we use a Spanish rice. We put a lot of seafood in the dish, shrimp and clams and mussels, but most importantly, this wonderful little spice at about $600 per pound, saffron goes into it that turns the dish this wonderful yellow color. And then of course, it's set out in a pattern to look like the patios of Spain. So this came to Louisiana, 1765. They couldn't make it because of the lack of spices and other things, so they started to uh, make the jambalaya. So you know what, guys? I think everybody knows what it is. What about if we eat it now, huh? Sounds this looks good. too good. Yeah, go ahead and dish up there, Ricky. I'm gonna get a look there. You have your spoon over there. And I know y'all want to taste this paella. <laughs> want to see where it can. That looks great. And the color is so so nice, and that's all natural, right? Oh, hey, 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 what happened to my meat in here? <laughs> uh, what happened to my meat? What, what, what are you doing? You're not taking this bag home. There you go. <laughs> Can you imagine a pot of jambalaya coming out of that gorgeous big round pan of paella with all of the seafood? And of course you can see how Louisiana would have been just instantly adapting that dish to what we call jambalaya today. And jambalaya is jambon with ham, a la with yaya, the African word for rice, jambon a la yaya, jambalaya, ham with rice. So, you know, and I have the, a great champion right here. We're gonna talk about that jambalaya. You just saw him. Uh, you just saw him on that little piece, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about it because I have a couple questions for you. But first, <laughs> I want to do the, one of the great Spanish soups that came to Louisiana very early on. Again, the use of olive oil. Olive oil came to Louisiana early on in the big barrels and, of course, crushed olives in the barrels as well. And somewhere in the market, people were taking bread and wiping up the crushed olives and olive oil and putting meat on it, and muffaladas came out of that. I mean, everybody was borrowing from everybody else back then. So what I'm going to do here is a sopadayo, a garlic soup. Very simple dish. Most of these dishes would have been very simple back then. So I'm going to begin with garlic. And I've slivered the garlic very thin and I'm going to put it in here because the wider the slivers, the more flavorful the oil, I mean the quicker the oil will flavor uh, from the, from the uh, garlic. The oil from the garlic will flavor that olive oil and put that nice garlic infused flavor uh, into it. I want to watch to see when the, the garlic starts to brown around the edge because that means that it's starting to, uh, to just very quickly get bitter right there. So this is very, very nice here. Now what I'm going to do into that is to brown my thickening agent. No, no roux. So the, the Spanish put bread into it and started, remember the bread they saved in the bakeries a while ago? Huh? They actually started to brown uh, this right here. And while the bread's browning in the bottom and picking up all of that garlic flavor, um, Paul, let me ask you one other question, but who, who do you think is the most influential of our Spanish governors? Well, Bernardo de Galvez, undoubtedly. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and why? Give me some of, uh, some because there was a lot of them. There were a lot of There were a lot of them, but uh, he, 
basically expanded Spanish control uh, into Mississippi and into Florida uh, and did a lot to get immigration. He, he was partially instrumental in getting the Acadians in here in, in 1783, uh, brought in other people. The Islenos came in under his, uh, roughly at the same time he was here. So yeah, he did, he did a lot of things. And uh, uh, one other question, uh, uh, we, we were talking earlier about Spanish crawfish because now mm -hmm. Malaga in the region of the south of Spain is now giving us all that good crawfish that are uh, uh, coming right. up here to right. help supplement the Louisiana crop, right? Mm -hmm. Have you had any of it? I've not had any Spanish crawfish. Yeah. Last time I, I asked about crawfish in Spain, they sold them for the equivalent of about $5 a piece. <laughs> oh, Lord, Si, I think we're going to Spain, huh? <laughs> well, that was 30 years ago. So. Y'all, look what I have here. I have my bread all, that's, that's the, the roux right here. I have it down in the pot, just getting nice and brown. The bread is uh, uh, toasted in the olive oil. Now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to actually use a wonderful chicken stock over the bread, which will break apart. Ooh, you talk about hot. This is cooking in cast iron here, y'all. When, uh, when you put heat on the cast iron pot, you're gonna get some serious cooking going on. Uh, the tomato, a little bit, of course, you could put saffron in here to give it a really wonderful flavor. The garlic is all over the bread right now. Now, uh, 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 T. Wayne, I'm coming to you with a good jambalaya question because uh, you know that jambalaya you make is absolutely fantastic. Now, you actually won the Champ of Champs. What does that mean? Uh, the Champ of Champs is a contest that um, all of the past champs in the past years compete against each other and is named the Champ of Champs. And it, it kind of signifies the opening of the Jumalai Festival, which is Memorial Day weekend every year. So, uh, so, so every year, how many people compete in that Jumalai Festival in Louisiana? This year, I think we had 118. Give us, give us the greatest tip. If I want to come over there and just really take it. <laughs> hey, he can't compete anymore, you know? He's, he's got to sit on the sideline. Look, it'll only be between us. Uh, what, 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 people, what are people looking for? Um, you know, the, the texture of the rice. You know the rice has got to be real fluffy. Um, you want kind of a, not really a, a bright saffron colored rice, but, you know, a nice golden brown. Um, a lot of chicken flavor and... And again, your, your rice texture's got to be perfect. That's all. That's all. <laughs> That's all. You got to cook on a wood fire, you know. <laughs> well, anyway, you make absolutely great jambalaya. And of course, y'all, it was from that great dish paella. The Spanish not able to find a lot of the ingredients in Louisiana. They, we, they didn't know about the clams on the Gulf. They didn't have saffron coming into the port yet. So what did they do? They just adopted uh, all of the great flavors of Louisiana. They took the fresh pork, which we had a lot of. They took sausages, which were preserved by smoke. And of course, chickens and pigs and any developing cuisine kind of take care of themselves. So there's a lot of it. And of course, mixed with the rice that was a gift from Africa, all of a sudden became the new dish that had been sought after by the, uh, by the Spanish. And doctor, one, one final question. If you had to say the one greatest contribution of the Spanish to modern day Louisiana other than architecture, what would it be? Oh dear. Um, I know the answer. Names. <laughs> names of places. What? Names of places probably. Names of places, uh, ab absolutely. And of course the architecture of the, of the quarter as you go through it, really, really just just uh, uh, fantastic to see all of those. And, and of course the names, Miro and all of those wonderful names. You say, where did that come from? That's Spanish. Y'all, this is gonna cook and you always crack an egg into it, Paul. Uh, write it in. You put an egg right into it, but we do that with spaghetti, we do that with sauce, we, call, we do it with everything, but it's a gift from the Spanish again. And I want y'all to see what it looks like when it's all done right here. Take a look at this. Look down into it. It's a very, as I said, it's a simple dish, and that egg is down into the bottom of the pot just like that. And what would we serve with this? What's another great gift of the Spanish? Look right here. Uh, boiled custard tart because flans and custards were all over gifts by the Spanish. No doubt about that. So you just keep your eye on that real fast. Y'all, time flies when you're enjoying great food and good conversation with friends in the kitchen. Thanks for stopping by as we continue to explore the unique food heritage of Louisiana and cook up another great taste of this state. There's none better. Absolutely none better. Thank y'all for being here. I'm going to finish this up.
To purchase the Encyclopedia of Cajun and Creole Cuisine by Chef John Bowles, featuring more than 750 traditional recipes, a CD-ROM of the book, or a copy of the program featuring all three episodes of Today's Culture, call the number on your screen. Major underwriting for A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles was provided by the Baton Rouge Convention and Visitors Bureau. In Baton Rouge, our past is your present. Baton Rouge, authentic Louisiana at every turn. And People's Drug Stores, serving South Louisiana for generations. George and Shirley Piku are proud supporters of A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Where you have this architecture, history, music, and the bittersweet cry of the blues. Especially the blues. There you go. How about a dozen? Red beans and rice. We're rolling, y'all.